Welcome to Calvary Church with Skip Heitzig. Did you know that about 90% of the book of Revelation either quotes or references the Old Testament? From the beginning, the Lord communicated a great deal about the future to His people. In this teaching series, Pastor Skip explains the theology of the end times and the differing conclusions biblical scholars have reached. The end may be nearer than you think. We're finding that God is doing exactly what He said. tornado outbreak continuing in the South. Right now. Urgent shelter in place. Know the World Health Organization just to, to declare this a global health the city emergency. city of over in Iraq. I think it's going to be rebuilt. There's already things happening there today. And, you know, right. Now for the last look. Turn in your Bibles to the first book in the New Testament, the Gospel of Matthew, the 24th chapter. So open those Bibles. Let's settle in for this Bible study. Um, there's always events that happen that get our attention, and those of us who are prophetically in tune or scripturally curious, we wonder about whether it's Chinese spy balloons uh, flying in our country or it's a spill of chemicals uh, in the Midwest or earthquakes in Turkey. We just, we just go, hmm, interesting. Where does that fit in? Or events like the World Economic Forum that happened recently in Davos. Just that title uh, gets some of our attention. Or as what happened last week, the World Government Summit. Um, I'm not making more out of those than just mentioning them to you, but with that come a host of predictions. So I brought with me a little book that I just wanted to show you. It's a little bit outdated, and at the same time it's not. Let me explain that. It's called Predictions for the Next Millennium. So this is a book that was put out at at the end of the last millennium, so around 24 years ago, uh, about 1999, it was put out. And uh, it, they, they got celebrities, scientists, entertainers to make predictions of what would happen in our world in the next millennium. Well, we're 23 years into the next millennium. And so let me just say that looking at their predictions, it's a bit laughable. Um, most of them said there's going to be world peace. There's going to be a cure to every disease. Um, uh, Mario Andretti said there's going to be auto racing on Mars. So, so far, uh, they're all batting zero in making predictions of what's going to happen. The Bible makes predictions about what's going to happen on a number of different fronts. But you know what? God graciously tells us just enough without telling us too much because frankly there's some things about your future you don't really want to know there was a man walking along the beach he ran into a, a little magic um, genie uh, bottle and uh, it was used up two wishes had already been granted uh, there was a one wish that was left and so you know, the man rubbed the lamp and out popped the genie. The genie said, like, you only got one left, so make it good. And the man said, my wish is I'd like a copy of the stock page, the Financial Times, exactly one year from now. So the genie said, no problem. Poof, he was gone. Lamp was gone. In its place, a copy of the stock page from a year in advance. Man was so excited because he knows, I can invest with confidence. It'll be a windfall. As the paper falls to his lap, it turns over, and on the other side of the financial page is the obituary column. <laughs> and there was a name at the top of the list that got his attention. It was his name. So the future is exciting until it's not. And uh, some things about the future are exciting. Some things about the future are excruciating. Matthew 24 has both. Jesus 
makes some exciting announcements about his coming, but also some excruciating announcements as well. We're doing a little series. We started a couple weeks ago on eschatology. Eschatology meaning a study of the end times. Eschatos means final or end. And um, it's, it's a, uh, an interesting approach uh, that I'm taking uh, on this study. I don't want you to be fuzzy or uncertain about these things. I want you to be in the know. And because of that, I was a little bit worried about this series. I asked some of my staff this week, um, how deep do you think I should go with this? I mean, should I just sort of keep it light and easy? And, and they said, no, please, go deep. So um, uh, I, I apologize if uh, today and next week it's going to feel like drinking out of a fire hose, but I, I'm going to do that. I'm going to uh, try to approach it in a way that um, I cut no corners and I give you full information and uh, that it will become beneficial. I'm going to go uh, deep, and we're going to take a good period of time to go through this, so we have uh, weeks and weeks of this. Um, this is what you need to know about the future. It is going somewhere. God has plans, big plans. Uh, it is not random. It is not haphazard. It is not stagnant. That is, it's not the same events over and over and over again. There's an actual end that the Bible predicts, an end of the world. But I know you know this. It's not as straightforward as some of us might like it to be. And because of that, either ignorance or uh, hyper-diligence, uh, some people have taken advantage of that and exploit that to their own advantage. Let me give you a few examples. Back in 1844, a man by the name of William Miller, he was a, a lay Baptist preacher, was convinced he knew exactly the day Jesus was coming back. And he announced it as October 22, 1844. The f movement became known as the Millerite movement. People sold their possessions, quit their jobs. They put on white robes on that day and climbed hillsides. I don't know why they did that, maybe to get closer. Um, but, of course, it never happened. When it didn't happen, that was known as the Great Disappointment. I'll say. Uh, then, fast forward to a few years back, some of us may remember what happened in 1988. Any of you remember the book that was published in 1988 called 88 Reasons Why Jesus is Returning in 1988? Anybody remember that here? Um, okay, so some of you do. What I remember is some people in this church told me I had to tell people about that book. And I said, no, I won't. <laughs> and um, Edgar Weissnant was the author, 88 Reasons Why Jesus Was Coming Back. You know, it's one thing to write a book and be wrong. It's another thing to write a book and be wrong 88 times. <laughs> and boy, was he wrong. A few years after that, Harold Camping came on the scene. Harold Camping was the president of Family Radio. He announced Jesus would come back in 94. When that was wrong, he announced another date, May 21st, 2011. When that was wrong, he chose another date, October 21st, 2011. All wrong. We all agree Jesus is coming. We all agree we should be ready. But the exact time of that event and how that will happen, that is a debated topic. So we have a little bit of a problem. I call this the problem of Christ's return. You might be wondering, what, what kind of a problem could we have with Christ's return? So I want to put it up sort of in stages. Um, uh, first of all, um, the problem can be stated as such. Jesus promised to return at any time and told us to be ready for that. But the Bible also says certain signs must happen before his return. So, how are we to understand Jesus' promise to return? You get the problem? The Bible says, be ready, be ready. Could happen at any moment, but on the other hand, it says, can't happen until all these signs 
are fulfilled. So what are we to make of the return? How do we solve that problem? Well, let's begin with the promise, an exciting promise. In verse 30 of Matthew 24, and again, this is a big chapter, so we're only going to, on this uh, take, just skim over parts of it. But go down to verse 30 and look at this. Then, and we'll discuss when the then is, then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven. He's announcing his coming. Go down to verse 44. Therefore, you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Pretty exciting news. Ever since Jesus came to earth the first time, he announced that he would be back for the second time. The disciples were not expecting this. The disciples did not expect Jesus to, having come to the earth, leave and then come back. That was not in their thinking. So in verse 3, by the way, Matthew 24 and 25 is Jesus' answer to a question the disciples asked in Matthew 24, verse 3. And the question is this. They came to him and they said, tell us, when will these things... Actually, it's three questions... When will these things be, and what is the sign of your coming, and of the end of the age? Three separate questions. When will these things be, the things of the temple being destroyed, which Jesus just predicted? Interesting, Jesus does not answer that question in Matthew 24. When will these things be? What is the sign of your coming, and of the end of the age? He answers especially the end of the age question along with his coming in Matthew 24. But when the disciples are saying, tell us the sign of your coming, they are not in their minds thinking that he's leaving and coming back. They're Jews, and their theology was pretty fixed at that time. They, They thought that Jesus would come in power in the temple to take over. So when they're asking the sign of his coming, what they mean is, when are you coming to this place to take over as the Messiah? Now let me explain this to you. Uh, The Jews at that time, including the disciples, had a pretty fixed theological construct or eschatology about the end times. Number one, they believed that just before the Messiah comes, there will be a time of terrible turmoil on the earth which they saw as fulfilled in the Roman occupation of their land. Romans were in charge. The Jews were no longer in charge. And so they saw that kind of persecution as the terrible time of turmoil. Fulfilled. Check. Number two, during that time of turmoil, they believed that an Elijah-like forerunner would come on the scene, announcing the Messiah. They saw that as fulfilled in John the Baptist. That's why everybody was interested in John the Baptist when he showed up. Number three, after that, the Messiah will appear, establish his kingdom on earth, and defeat the enemies of the Jews. And number four, all the scattered Jews will return to Israel. Jerusalem will be restored and enjoy a time of peace. The disciples believed they were in phase three. Turmoil has come. Elijah-like forerunner has come. The Messiah has come. Couple days before this, Jesus has entered Jerusalem on a donkey, and everybody said, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. So the disciples are like, it's showtime. He's going to come soon to this place and take over as the Messiah. Well, their thinking is going to be changed because in a couple days, he's going to sit down with them in an upper room for a last meal. We call it the Last Supper. It is a Passover meal. And during that time, he's going to tell them, I'm going to die. Then I'm going to be resurrected and leave. And then I'm going to come back at some point, which they just kind of looked at him and probably like deer in a headlight, like, huh? They didn't get it. 
But he said this, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. Listen, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am, there you may be also. He tells them, I'm dying, I'm leaving, and I'm coming again. So their whole theology is changing. Now, there's a whole set of Bible verses that say that there's going to be a sudden and unexpected coming of Jesus Christ. A sudden and unexpected. I'm going to give you just a sampling of that. There are many, many verses. I could cover this for weeks, but I'm just going to give you a sampling. So Matthew 25, verse 13, Jesus said, Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour when the Son of Man is coming. Philippians chapter 3, verse 20, Paul speaking, Our citizenship is in heaven, from which we eagerly wait for the Savior. Titus chapter 2, verse 13, also written by Paul, We should live soberly, righteously, godly in this present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. James, whole different author, James chapter 5, verse 8, the coming of the Lord is at hand. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. 1 Peter, again, another author, 1 Peter 4, verse 8, the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, the day of the Lord will come as a thief. How does a thief come? Suddenly, unexpectedly. That's the ploy of a thief. Thief doesn't call in advance saying, Can I come now? You don't know when he's coming. It's sudden, it's unexpected. 1 John chapter 2, verse 18. Little children, it is the last hour. And as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come, by which we know it is the last hour. Then there's the book of Revelation. Six times, six times in Revelation, Jesus says, Behold, I am coming quickly. And finally, at the end of the book, the sixth time he says it, John says, Even so, come, Lord Jesus. So the blunt force of all of these passages seems to say that Jesus could come at any moment moment, and we should be ready for it. Now, that is known as the doctrine of imminency, the imminent return, I-M-M-I-N-E-N-T, the imminent return of Christ. That means impending, likely to happen soon, could happen at any moment. One in every 25 verses in the New Testament make reference to the coming of Christ, 50 times, five zero, 50 times in the New Testament, we are told to be ready for it. Be ready for it. I remember when I first came to Jesus Christ. This was back in 19, um, 1973. And uh, Jesus movement was in full bloom. And, and I had a bumper sticker on my car that said, Jesus is coming soon. I still believe that. There were other bumper stickers. One said, Jesus is coming, are you ready? Another bumper sticker, Jesus is coming, look busy. And another one that said, Jesus is coming, and boy, is he ticked off. Of course, they use a slightly different word that I will not repeat. Uh, But I believed that then, and I believe that now. I believe in the imminent return of Christ. It can happen in any moment. But we have a problem. We now go from the promise to the problem that exists. There's a whole other set of verses that indicate Jesus cannot return to this earth unless certain signs take place first. And I want to run through those signs with you quickly. There are six of them that I'm going to outline. Number one is deception. Look at verse 4. Jesus begins to answer their question. 
Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. You'll hear of wars, rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Can't happen yet. There's other things that have to happen. Go down to verse 11. Many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. So deception is the first sign. Now, would you agree that, well, let me ask you this. Is deception uh, a new thing or has it always been around? It's always been around. It's been around since the Garden of Eden. Since Satan first showed up and deceived Eve and told her lies, there's been deception in every single era of history. But in the end of days, there will come an ultimate kind of deception, an ultimate kind of deceiver. You might call it Satan's masterpiece, what the Bible calls in a couple of places the Antichrist. And this leader will head a confederation of nations. Jesus himself predicted this. John chapter 5, he said, I have come in my Father's name, and you did not receive me. Another will come in his own name, and him you will receive. And the world will indeed receive him. He's typically called the Antichrist. He has several other monikers, including the man of sin, the lawless one, the beast, the little horn, the prince that shall come, the willful king, the idle shepherd. He's the ultimate deceiver. He's the ultimate wolf in sheep's clothing. And because number six is typically associated with mankind, because God created man on the sixth day of creation, his number will be 666 in some form. Man, 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 the ultimate man. Deception, that's the first sign. Second sign that must happen first, tribulation. Look at verse 7. For nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines, pestilences, earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will be offended will betray one another, will hate one another. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many, and because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. Go down to verse 21. For then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved, but for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. Now, this is not just a tribulation. We're talking about the tribulation. This is not just a bad day, a bad season, a trial that you're having. It's talking about the tribulation. Now, let me get a little more technical. It is believed that Verses 4 of Matthew 24 through 14 deal with the first half of that seven-year period, and that verse 15 onward deal with the second half, also known as the Great Tribulation. So, there were dark ages in the past. This is the darkest age that we're talking about. There were tough times in the past. We're dealing now with the toughest time. If you thought the pandemic was hard, you ain't seen nothing yet. Daniel said, there will be a time of trouble such as has never been since there was a nation. Now, that's saying something. Uh, If you were to Google worst times in history, If you were to add or put in your little Google search, worst times or worst moments in history, please don't do that now. It would yield a list including World War I, World War II, the Holocaust, the Black Plague of Europe, the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the transatlantic slave trade. 
all of those times are nothing compared to the tribulation that is coming. And all you have to do is look at the book of Revelation, which will detail that. You see judgments that come that are progressive and increasingly intense. There are um, represented by seven seals that are broken. Think of wax seals on a document that reveal something. And the seven seals then usher in seven trumpet judgments that usher in seven bowl judgments that are poured out upon the earth. So deception, tribulation must happen. Number three, devastation. Devastation. Go down to verse 29 of Matthew 24. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, get this, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then, then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. If you were to turn, and we will in this series, to the book of Revelation, where the tribulation begins, which is, I believe, Revelation chapter 6, John sees in his vision this weird stampede of four horses, they're called the four horsemen of the apocalypse. And the horses are different colors. The first one is white, uh, followed then by uh, a red horse, followed by a black horse, followed by a pale green horse. It's like watching a western on LSD. <laughs> Not that I would know anything about that, <laughs> just saying. The first horse, guy on the white horse, is a leader it says, who comes conquering and to conquer. So he brings um, a temporary short-lived peace, but other horses follow. He brings with him war, famine, and death, so that one-fourth of the population of the earth is destroyed. And that's just the beginning. That's just the beginning. According to Jesus in verse 8, all these are the beginning of sorrows. You have wars, rumors of wars. That's just the beginning. Now, I know you hear that and you go, really? That's just the beginning? How bad could it get? Well, I'm glad you asked. Following those judgments in Revelation are seven trumpet judgments that include in Revelation chapter 8, hail and fire from the sky, the rivers on the earth and the springs of water being polluted, the grass and all the green things on the earth being burned up, followed by Revelation chapter 9 where the bottomless pit will be opened and out of that belches designer locusts, which are demons, the Bible says, that have the power to torment humans on the earth for five straight months. That is followed by a series of bold judgments, Revelation chapter 16, which include malignant sores on the body, water sources, again, poison, sun scorching the flesh of people on the earth, and hailstones weighing 75 pounds apiece careening to the earth. That's devastation. That's devastation. The power of the heavens, Jesus said, will be shaken. So we have deception, tribulation, devastation. Let me give you a fourth sign. Has to happen. Proclamation. Proclamation. Go back to verse 14. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. You see that? Can't come until that happens worldwide proclamation of the gospel. Now, I can't tell you how many times I've heard mission organizations absolutely butcher this text. And they, they remove it from its eschatological prophetic context and they, they say something like this. Look, Jesus can't come back till we get the whole world hearing the gospel. So hasten the day of the Lord as if you could bring Jesus back sooner on your own. Listen, Jesus will come back, but he will come back at the appointed time of the Father and not before. 
We can't schedule his return by telling people the gospel. And this is where I wish they would just keep reading to the end of the book, the end of the Bible, because it explains this worldwide proclamation quite readily. If you read Revelation chapter 11, we read about two witnesses that come to Jerusalem, but their activities are seen by everyone and heard by everyone on the planet. That couldn't happen unless there were satellite technology. And then also, during that time will come a preaching angel. Did you know this? There will be an angel that flies through heaven and gets the gospel out to everyone. Revelation chapter 14, verse 6, Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. You put that together with this promise in verse 14 and say, oh, now I get it. That's how it's going to happen. And then the end will come. Let me give you a fifth sign. Abomination. Abomination. Look at verse 15. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, that's a technical term from Daniel, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place. And notice this. Whoever reads, let him understand. Jesus anticipates somebody's going to be able to read this and go, this is that. It's happening. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Notice that nothing is said of Albuquerque so far or Santa Fe or Phoenix or L.A. or anywhere in the United States or any other capital in the world. Then... Those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who is on the housetop not go down to take anything out of his house. If you have trouble understanding that, come with us to Israel and you'll get it. And let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days and pray that your flight, your fleeing, may not be in winter or on the Sabbath. This is a very Judeo-centric prediction. It, it, it keeps in mind that it's taking place in Jerusalem, in Judea, at the temple. The abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place. The holy place was a section in the temple, which no longer exists today. But there will be, the Bible predicts, a temple in Jerusalem in the future. According to Daniel chapter 9, Jesus references Daniel. According to Daniel chapter 9, a prince, a ruler, we know him as the Antichrist, will make a treaty with the Jewish nation for seven years. In the middle of that seven-year period, he'll break the deal. He'll renege on the treaty and set up some kind of abomination in the temple. You wonder, well, what could that be? Well, Paul the Apostle fills in a little bit of the blank in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, describing the man of sin who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped so that he sits in the temple of God to show himself that he is God. So this guy is going to come in the temple in Jerusalem, break the covenant of the Jewish nation, and create this, what Jesus called the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel, spoken of by Jesus, spoken of by Paul, incidentally predicted also by John. So that's five signs so far. Let me give you a sixth. Salvation. Salvation. Now, it's only hinted at here. It's then extrapolated, and the detail is filled in later on by Paul. But I want you to look at verse 22. Unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved, but for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. It's going to be only a three and a half year period that those judgments take place in. Then, if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or there, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, the elect, as if to say, it's not possible. The elect. Now, when you read the words elect, I know you think, well, that, that's me. I'm the elect. 
I love you, but don't flatter yourself thinking that it's always about you or me. I don't think he's talking about the church elect here. He's talking to disciples. They had no notion of a church at all yet. Even though Jesus said he would build it, they didn't understand that. That, They're not thinking along those terms. I think what he's talking about here are people alive at the time who are Jewish believers in Jesus. How do I know this? Paul the Apostle in Romans, three chapters, talks about the future salvation of the Jewish people. And he said, look, God sidelined them for a period of time. But he said, if they're, if they're falling, made riches for the Gentile world, how much more their fullness? That's Romans chapter 11, verse 12. Then he continues, Romans 11, verse 25 and 26. Blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness or the full number of the Gentiles has come in and so all Israel will be saved as it is written. And then he quotes Psalms and Isaiah. You say, well, what do you mean all Israel will be saved? Well, fast forward to Revelation. We're actually given the number of saved Jewish people. Anybody know the number? 144,000, 12,000 out of each tribe, and the tribes are listed, just so you you have no mistake about this. 12,000 from each tribe, saved and sealed by God. Now, there's going to be two witnesses that appear on the scene, very powerful ministry uh, in Jerusalem to the Jerusalemites. There's going to be an angel flying through heaven. 144,000 Jewish people will be saved. Listen, have you ever seen one Jewish person who's saved? They're very animated and very persuasive. When you get a Jewish believer, uh, you know, imagine 144,000 Paul the Apostles. The net result of the angel flying through heaven, the two witnesses in Jerusalem, the 144,000 saved Jews, The result of that will be this incredible multitude, it says in Revelation 7, a great multitude no one could number of all the nations standing before God's throne. I believe the greatest revival in history is yet to come, a time of unparalleled salvation during the most difficult time. So we obviously have a problem because over and over and over, we're said, Jesus could come. It could happen any time. Get ready. Be ready. Be watchful. At the same time, well, this has got to happen first, and that's got to happen first, and all these signs have to be fulfilled first. So what is the solution? That leads me to the third aspect, and that is a principle that explains. How do we solve this problem of it could happen at any moment? It can't happen at any moment. Well, here's one solution that someone has come up with, and that is to say Jesus cannot come at any moment. Yes, there are people who say that in the church. Jesus cannot come at any moment because those signs have not yet occurred. One of the famous books on systematic theology years ago written by Louis Burkhoff states this, and I quote, according to the scriptures, Several important events must occur before the return of the Lord, and therefore, it cannot be said to be imminent. Here's a guy saying, Jesus can't come back at any moment. Well, if that were so, that would totally nullify the force of all those commandments to be ready, be ready, be ready, be watchful, could happen, you never know, it's sudden, it's unexpected, like a thief. I mean, why are we told to watch and be ready for something that can't happen? That's like, wait for it, watch for it, psych, it's not going to happen, not going to happen. That's contradictory, so I don't buy that explanation. Second solution uh, offered by some is that these signs have already been fulfilled in the past in early church history during the Roman Empire. And you go, really? Really? So explain that to me. And they'll say, well, the gospel sort of went everywhere. And there was persecution during that time. And you could say that what Caesar, Nero, and Caligula, and a few other emperors did was like 
tribulation, and there were some Jews who were saved, and that is a position called the preterist position. Preterist is a a Latin term that means the past. It's all fulfilled in the past. R.C. Sproul, who is sort of the spokesperson for this uh, position, said, and I quote, I'm convinced that the substance of the Olivet Discourse, that's Matthew 24, was fulfilled in A.D. 70. All these things were fulfilled. So they see the destruction of the temple as the abomination of desolation, and some of them even believe Jesus has come back. Now, I know you're thinking, did, did I miss that? Because I, I, I don't think I ever saw that. Um, what they'll say is that uh, Jesus came back, but it was a spiritual return, not a physical return. And, and, and my answer to that is, you've got to be kidding me. You're telling me the early church or these disciples endured to the end? Verse 13, saw worldwide evangelism, verse 14, saw the abomination of desolation, verse 15, saw worldwide darkness and stars falling from the sky, verse 29. I don't think so. I think what that speaks of are future Jewish believers who are going to see those things during the tribulation period. Okay, we still haven't solved the problem. What's the solution? Let me offer you this solution. A two-staged coming. A two-staged coming. That, number one, he's going to come for his church, not to the earth, but in the atmosphere somewhere. And then seven years later, return with his church to the earth at his second coming. So the first time that he comes for his church is an event that is preceded by no signs whatsoever. None. It's a signless event. Could happen at any moment. That's why we're told to watch. Wait, be ready for it. Be eager for it. Can happen suddenly like a thief in the night. But then he'll come with his church to the earth in glory. That is the event that is preceded by all these signs. Now that solves a lot of problems, including the timetable portion of the problem, which is the 70 weeks prophecy of Daniel. We're going to take a whole weekend and look at that. So... In the rapture, let's call it rapture versus return. At the rapture, Jesus comes for his church. At the return, Jesus comes with his church, Revelation 19. At the rapture, Jesus comes in the air, and we meet him up in the air, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 17. At the return, Jesus comes from heaven through the atmosphere, through the air, all the way down to the earth. At the rapture... Um, That is an event that is sudden. It is unpredictable. What Paul said in 1 uh, 1 Corinthians 15, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, suddenly. So it's unpredictable. Whereas the second coming or the return is highly predictable. Seven years after the rapture. Let me be more precise. Let's just imagine that we are in the tribulation. I don't think we'll ever see it, but let's just say we are. Let's say this is the tribulation period, and we read the morning newspaper that somebody has set up an image, an idol, in the holy place in a rebuilt temple in Jerusalem. And you go, this is it. It's the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet. I could say to you on that day, if you were to count 42 months from today, 1,260 days from today, Jesus is going to return to this earth. I could say that because it says that in the book of Revelation. It gives that timetable, 42 months, 1,260 days. That is a highly predictable event. By the way, never are we told in the Bible to look forward to the tribulation period. The Bible doesn't say, watch for it, wait for it, be eagerly waiting, the worst time in the world. We are indeed, however, told to anticipate and look forward to his coming. So I believe then, to end it all this morning, the next event on God's time schedule is the rapture of the church. There's nothing that has to be fulfilled uh, before that happens. No prophecy has to be fulfilled for that to happen. 
Once that happens, God's prophetic clock will resume in terms of Dan, Daniel's 70-week timetable, which I will explain to you in depth in the future. Once that occurs, the rapture of the church, then these signs, famine, pestilence, earthquakes in various places, worldwide deception, all happening like birth pains in intensity and frequency. So, the good news is Jesus is coming back. The bad news is Jesus is coming back. Yeah, it's both exciting and excruciating, and it depends on who you are. It depends on what decision you have made. It depends on where you are at in your life with God. Martin Luther said, preach as if Jesus Christ was crucified yesterday, rose from the dead today, and is coming back tomorrow. I think we should live as if Jesus was crucified yesterday, rose from the dead today, and is coming back tomorrow. He could come at any time, because you know what? He could come at any moment. And there are certain things that Jesus said, when these begin to happen, lift up your eyes, because your salvation draws near. So he could come at any moment. And that's good news, but it's also bad news. It's a problem unless your life is aligned with his. And if it's not, let it be so today. Father, thank you for your word. Uh, we are thankful, Lord, that there are now chapters and verses that we can make reference to, and it's much easier to peruse and find these things and put it all together. And though you haven't told us everything, you've told us enough, enough to excite us and enough to warn us. Excite us because we wait our Savior. Warn us if Jesus is not yet our Savior. I pray for anyone here who does not know Jesus personally, that if they don't, they will say yes to him. And if you're here today, you can do that right now. If you're watching online or you're watching this uh, on your YouTube channel, whatever it might be, right where you are, if you're not right with God why don't you make a choice, a decision to get on the right side of history, the right side of the future, God's side. And if you're here or if you're watching online or on television or listening on the radio, would you offer a prayer to God and just say, Lord, I give you my life. I, I admit that I'm a sinner. I'm sorry. I turn from my sin. I turn to Jesus as Savior and Lord. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Give me power, strength to live a life pleasing to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us for this message from Calvary Church with Skip Heitzig. We would love to know how this message impacted you. Share your story with us. Email mystory at calvarynm.church. And if you'd like to support this Bible teaching ministry with a financial gift, visit calvarynm.church give.